All right. So uh, thanks very much. Um, my name is George Kovach, and uh, over the next little bit, I'm going to talk to you about the, the dangerous airway. Um, this is where I live on the, on the internet. Um, I've become a, an active tweeter over the past couple of years, and it's been an a interesting experience. And this is my uh, Twitter handle, at uh, GJ. If you uh, want to tweet, um, I tweet primarily airway-related material. And AIM Airway is uh, where I live uh, on our website. And I think we have some reasonable educational material for you. Um, you can take a look at that at your, at your leisure. These are my uh, disclosures. They're written in visible ink. And uh, that's all I have uh, to disclose. So this is the plan. Now, if, you, if you're here to listen to me talk to you about managing this kind of difficult airway, this is a case that presented about 15 years ago with a, quote, branch in his neck, um, then you're in the wrong place. Because um, I'm not going to give you any technical pearls about how to manage this particular case. However, what I, what I, what I want to focus in on is how to avoid shitting yourself when faced <laughs> with this kind of case in front of you. And that's really the purpose of this talk, and in part defines what we call the dangerous airway. Now, to take you on this, uh, this journey of how I ended up on this stage, I, I need to take you back to 1991. And 1991 was, was a, a scary time for various reasons. But for me in particular, it was scary because the mullet was the predominant haircut. <laughs> so it's all business on top, party in the back, as they say. And I was uh, sporting a, a dandy mullet at the time. But at that, at that time, I had finished uh, my, my internship on a Wednesday. And on Monday, I was working at the North Side General. Actually, I was working in an office in, uh, in, in the North Side. And then uh, after my office, I went to the emergency department to do my first shift. And I got to tell you, you know, I thought I pretty, was pretty cool. I was you know, fresh out of uh, you know, school. I, I knew my stuff. And this is a picture of me. you know posing with the nurses, with my shades on, and, you know, I thought I had it all, you know, and then, and then reality struck, quite literally struck, and it, it, was, a, it was a train versus a car, and uh, I was working in the department, it was myself and, uh, and, and another nurse, and we hear that a case is coming in um, with this scenario, it was a train versus a vehicle. So I'm waiting anxiously, you know, all hyped up. I did my ATLS. I'm ready to take care of this patient. Ambulance pulls up, and as you might remember or know of back then, this was, these were taxi drivers who would get out of their cab, hop in an ambulance, and drive to the scene. So I see the, the, the ambulance driver get out, open up the back of the ambulance, grab this patient by his feet, throw him over his shoulder, and run in and plop him down, you know? And all of a sudden, you know, I was ready. My heart rate was 130. And then, oh, yeah, this is not a problem. This person's dead. I know how to manage those, right? <laughs> so so my, my heart rate came down. Everything was good. And he said, well, we got to go get the other one, right? So we had another one in the back of the ambulance. So it ran out, opened it up. I grabbed him by underneath the arms. He grabbed the feet, and we carried him. This person had all kinds of serious injuries. I have no idea. I can't remember that period at all. But somehow, that patient managed to survive. And it had nothing to do with my skill set. It just is proof that the human body is a very plastic and capable um, organism. And uh, so I'm sure that, that if I was to remember what I was using with a, a laryngoscope button, I looked in, I probably saw something like this. And if you can't see it in the back of the room, what we're looking at here is the glottis. You can't see cords here. It's this pink blob. You can see posterior retinoids, and that's all you can see. And I think we can all agree that this would be considered a difficult airway. And this is what a lot of talks about the difficult airway is around. How do we manage this? We can do ELM, we can do burp, we can do all these various things. But really, that's not what puts at, uh, the situation at great risk. What creates great risk and what creates the dangerous airway are other factors. And that's what I'm going to focus in on. Like, when's the last time that you intubated a patient? We are all here. I am an occasional intubator. And I work in a high volume center. This isn't happening three times a day, every day. And this influences patient outcomes, how experienced we are. There are other things there. What kind of equipment do you have at your disposal that is a basic kind of equipment? And then most of our patients, right, are not just 
you know, ill from a difficult anatomy or pathology point of view. They've got difficult physiology. They're unstable patients. And then, of course, what happens in our place, there's performance anxiety. Because, you know, when somebody's being managed in our department, there's a whole sort of gallery of people that are watching you try to secure that airway. And, of course, there's one person in that room who's tasked with this, right, to count the sacks as they fall. Right? That's their job. Who's going to count the sats as they fall? And they're screaming them out as, they, as it's happening. So the difficult airway is more than just managing this, managing this difficult view on laryngoscopy. It's how we manage these other things that ultimately influence patient outcomes and, again, is the focus of, of this talk. And the reason why I've really come to be on this stage and become a pseudo-expert in airway management is in part because of fear. You know, I was scared shitless about taking care of that patient. And, and ultimately, that, that made me say, okay, you know what, I've got to do something about that. Ultimately, I went back, I did a residency, and then I came into practice after doing the residency, and I thought it was shit hot again, right? Until the next airway came in, and I realized that I was humbled by that experience, and I realized that still airway management caused me anxiety, and, and ultimately, we ended up uh, putting together a course that's been going on for the past 15 plus years, uh, the, the AIM program. But still, when we teach AIM, right, we focus in on these anatomical issues, how we overcome that difficult airway. So let's, let's talk quickly what, what conventionally we refer to when we're, we're talking about the, the difficult airway. We talk about difficult laryngoscopy. That's what the view was. I can't really get the view I want. For those of you that are using video laryngoscopy, it's often not the, the laryngoscopy that's a challenge. It's the intubation that's a, the challenge. And I'm sure you might have experienced this when you've got that beautiful view and you're trying to fish that tube in, down that hole and it's not going down so easily. There's also difficult mass ventilation, difficult, difficult supraglottic airway ventilation, and now the new terminology on the block from an airway management point of view, difficult phona. Phono stands for front of neck airway, um, otherwise called the, the surgical airway. And there's all kinds of acronyms out there to help us identify the difficult uh, airway, difficult laryngoscopy, inter intubation, et cetera. And there's no shortage of algorithms to help us try to make decisions in taking care of, uh, of these patients. So the difficult airway has been usually framed about this. So it's either difficult native anatomy, right? I'm looking at you, everybody in the crowd, and say, oh, you might be a tough tube, you might be tough to mass ventilate, et cetera. And then there's difficult pathology, and it might be as obvious as a big stick or an arrow through the neck or whatever it is that it's pretty clear that this is potentially going to pose uh, challenges. But the difficult emergency patient um, involves much more than this, right? So it's difficult physiology, and this influences the way we're going to manage that airway. The most common reason why I'm doing an awake intubation is apnea intolerance, the hypoxic patient that I can't pre-oxygenate properly. And then there's the issue of cooperation. How do we make the patient cooperative? Or is that patient going to be cooperative to give me an option of doing an awake approach? So this is the way we frame the difficult airway. But there are other factors that influence patient outcome. And again, I'm going to spend the remainder of the talk discussing this. And these are really environmental issues, right? So, so they're, they're provider issues related to experience, related to equipment, what support, and they define the difficult airway also, and together these two things, both patient and environmental issues, are collectively what we're referring to as the dangerous airway. Now, I used to give a version of this talk, and it was called the psychologically difficult airway. And, and uh, this is, the rest of this talk is, I guess, some airway management psychotherapy that I'm going to deliver and bill you all for later. But when we see this, that this is case that, that's coming in, and, and I'm taking a picture of, of our grease board in our department. These are two cases coming in within 15 minutes of each other. The first one is a, is a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the face. And the second one that's supposed to be coming in is a morbidly obese patient post-hanging, both coming in unintubated, right? So we can talk about how are you going to manage this patient. But really what I want to do is talk about how you're going to manage yourself to take care of this patient effectively. Because what happens in our house is that we get trauma team and we get everybody but dermatology and psychiatry in the room, 
who's gathered to take care of, uh, of this patient. And everybody's pretty calm and casual. Say, yeah, do yeah, you try out that new burger at the uh, you know, other places? Everybody's looking pretty calm. But I know if I was to look inside and take their pulse, you know, that they're feeling quite differently than they're looking at this, at this point. And one of the greatest challenges we have to success in airway management is, is, is our fears and our fears of, of, of failure. This is where I, I go back to talking to my kids. I've got four kids um, that are now sort of grown and, 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 and out of the house, but they've been here in this part of my talk for about 10 years. And these are the four C's of success. And I'm going to frame the remainder of the talk around these four C's of competence, context, confidence, and conscientiousness. And we need to redefine success from an airway management to saying, oh, let's look at this patient. When we walk by and we see this person, we say, oh, nice tube. That must have been a tough airway. Well, it might have been. That doesn't mean it's successful because they got the tube, because we had no idea what happened in the process of getting that tube. We might have knocked off way more brain cells than we've saved in, in, uh, in uh, performing advanced airway management in that particular case. So in order to look at competence, though, a, a bit further, what we do need to do is, is understand what successful airway management means. And this is where we've proposed the, the, the rule of 90s. And it's a convenient number. And uh, let me explain further what I mean by the rule of 90s. So the rule of 90 begins with what we should expect as an emergency department for your first pass success rate. If you look at the historical standard of tens of thousands of patients using old-fashioned equipment such as a direct laryngoscope, the industry standard for first pass success rate in an emergency department should be upwards of around 85%. Interestingly, if you look at the literature, the numbers are, have, have actually decreased, and I can talk to you for a great length why I think that that's the case. But I think that that's where, where it has been, and there are some places that are reporting upwards of 90. Our air program, Life Flight, has a first pass success rate of, of upwards of, of 90%. And that's, I think, what we should be aiming for. But, but Having a first pass success rate of 90% is only good if you've done the other things, right? So it's not a benefit if you've done it and the patient's you know, SATs plummet to 70% uh, percent during intubation. So we want to maintain SATs over 90%. We want to maintain their systolic blood pressure over 90 And we want to do it in a timely manner. And what I mean by in a timely manner is probably 90 seconds. 90 seconds is physiologically based on the fact that that's the amount of time that it will take for you to critically desat if you're inadequately pre-oxygenated. So that means that your primary approach, whether it's intubation, um, and then if that fails, re-oxygenation, that those either solely or together should happen in under 90 seconds. And if you're in a CICO scenario, can't intubate, can't oxygenate scenario, then you should be able to rescue oxygenate that patient with a supraglottic airway or by surgical airway in under 90 seconds, which is a real challenge to do. But if you want to do it, that's the, way, that's the goal that we should train um, towards. So success isn't just about getting the tube. It's getting the tube. Um, with a high first pass success rate, maintaining the saturations, avoiding hypotension, and doing it in a timely manner. So that's all part of competence. But how do we get there? Well, if we were to ask somebody by the name of Erickson, who's uh, done some, a lot of great work in this, say the key to being competent in airway management or any procedure is deliberate practice. And what deliberate practice is, it's not just you going off and putting tubes in a mannequin. It's about having the appropriate educational framework. And what that means is that it's part of an educational program, that you have the opportunity to practice, and that you have timely feedback to, as, part of that, uh, as part of that practice. And that practice needs to be effortful. In other words, it can't be just you doing it under conventional situations of you alone with a mannequin putting the tube. You need to challenge yourself. You need to create stressful scenarios in which you have to perform that, uh, that task at hand. Um, Malcolm Gladwell, in his, in his book Outliers, has a chapter called 10,000 Hours. And 10,000 Hours, that was his interpretation of what Erickson said is required to become an expert. That roughly works out to about 10 years. 
Um, and uh, my kids remind me that a, a much more uh, hip person um, said it in a song called 10,000 Hours. This is um, uh, Macklemore said it in his song saying, the greats weren't great because of birth they could paint. Their greats were great because they painted a lot. And the bottom line is you can't just you know, attain a certain skill level and you're going to maintain it then forever. You need to deliberately attain it and maintain it uh, with uh, the type of practice I just talked about over time. It's fascinating that if you look at other groups of experts, fighter pilots, professional athletes, or, or concert uh, uh, musicians, they spend upwards of 90 plus percentage of their time practicing, and only a small percentage of their time performing. But in medicine, we don't do that. We spend the majority of our time performing and very little time practicing. And I think if the public were aware of that, they probably wouldn't be too impressed that that's the uh, schema that we've adopted. Let's look at airway management. Let's look at intubation. The literature would say that to be minimally competent at airway management or intubation, it's between 40 and 80 tubes to sort of get there. But to be at, a, at an expertise level in managing the normal airway, it's probably upwards of 150 tubes to get there. Now that just often, again, based on our business, can seem you know, impractical. It's very challenging. But we're talking about just attaining, not maintaining. That's a whole other story there. But, but that, these numbers aren't true. And what I mean by this is it doesn't matter what you do in terms of the number of times you put in a tube. Again, it's the context, the educational context in which you've had for putting those tubes in. And this is what a deliberate practice event looks like. This is called the Adams, uh, Adams uh, uh, feedback loop. And let's take intubation, right? And when you're performing a procedure, um, there's all kinds of sensory information that comes from that procedure, the force that's required to get that view. There's that uh, sensory information of, the, of the, the, the sounds in the room, the smell in the room, the, the, the saturation tones that are changing. And all of that sensory information has to be perceived. And that perception can be just trial and error. Well, I did it and it didn't work that time, so next time I'm going to try something different. That's not good enough. What we need to do is, is to solicit and get feedback that's timely to say, no, the reason why you had a challenge with that view or that didn't go that well is because of this. Right? Then, then we have what's called knowledge of results. And knowledge of results is you saying, OK, I understand why this went well or didn't go so well. So that now we're able to change that procedure and ultimately have the desired outcome of putting the tube in the right hole. So that's really what a deliberate practice event should look like. So it's not about, about performance over, over time or performance against numbers. It's performance against, against deliberate practice events. So it might not be that you need 150, et cetera. It might be that you know, you're going to have X number uh, of procedures, and then you're going to be in the OR for a certain number of taking a course, and you're able to now um, have, a, have a more uh, a streamlined approach to, to attaining competence that's realistic for you to achieve. So that's competence. Next one is, is, is context or, or, or environment. Now, there's external environment, and an airway, that glottis looks the same whether it's in the OR or whether it's in the ED or whether it's in the pre-hospital setting. But those different environments create different circumstances and different stress. So anesthesia doesn't like intubating in our department. We wouldn't like intubating in the pre-hospital setting, right? So, you know, it's like saying, okay, we're all drinking alcohol here, but I know my anesthesia colleagues, they tend to drink more fancy drinks. They're, you know, the martini people. My eMERGE colleagues are the beer drinkers, and when I hang out with the, uh, the medics, I, I usually find myself drinking rum. Now, the, that, that's, that's the, uh, the, the external environment. The internal environment is what you're feeling inside when you're taking care of, uh, of a patient. When these are PJs, they're special ops uh, uh, medics that jump behind enemy, enemy lines to retrieve uh, um, uh, people and, and bring them out of peril. 
And when they train to manage their internal environment, right, to manage the stress, decrease their heart rate so that they can function under these high stakes scenarios, whereas we tend not to do that. We tend to be more task oriented and, and not, not treat looking after the really sick patient as a high stakes event the way we should. Now, another option for this talk I considered was, was A, you know, because A stands for airway, but I was going to talk, it was going to be airway anxiety in your amygdala. Let's talk about the amygdala for a second. Now, the amygdala, and I just learned this recently, is an almond-sized um, portion of your brain, which is responsible for, for uh, um, triggering your flight and fright response. So let's look and see how it works, right? So if you're out in the woods and you see a grizzly bear, this is what happens, right? So that sensory information goes you know, to your thalamus and then gets distributed to the various parts of your brain. So it goes to the motor cortex, say, you know what? Time to run, you know, let's go, right? And, and it goes to uh, you know, your, your visual cortex that references this grizzly bear saying something that represents danger that you should run, et cetera. And then what happens, that rational part of your brain says, okay, Let's tell the amygdala that we're not only going to run fast, you know, but we're going to run really fast and we're going to yell and scream when we run to try to scare that bear away and, and, uh, and be able to move really, really quickly. So that's the way it's supposed to work. But there's something called the amygdala hijack. And I'm sure everybody in this room has experienced it at one point or another. And what happens with the amygdala hijack is we see a scary thing, okay? And, and instead of it going to the rational part of the brain to say, you know what, you're okay, you're going to be able to manage this, it just goes right to the amygdala, right? And you get this sense of panic that doesn't allow you to think and doesn't allow you to process the scenario so you can manage it in an effective way. And, and this is something that we need to all figure out what's our personal trigger for this and how we're going to manage this when your heart rate is at 170. Because when your heart rate is at 170 because of psychological concern or fear, it's hard to bring that heart rate down and take care of your patient the way you need to. We all need a certain amount of adrenaline you know, and arousal to perform, right? And that's challenge, and challenge is good, right? But at some point, that challenge crosses the threshold, and it becomes threat. And then our performance decreases. So we need to ideally push that, that threshold to the right so that um, it doesn't trigger and make us dysfunctional when we need to uh, use those skills. This is a famous figure from, from Grossman's book on, on, on combat. And if you look at fear-related heart rate, how does that affect performance? Well, with a heart rate of around 115, you start to lose fine motor control. You need fine motor control to do intubation. Okay, to just place that blade tip properly in the vollecula and engage the hyoepiglottic ligament. It's a matter of millimeters. You need fine motor control to do it. At a heart rate of 115 or above, you start to lose that potentially. At a heart rate of 145 or so, you start to move, lose gross motor capabilities and sometimes can only you know, block move. Right? You don't look like this, but, but your, your capabilities, again, are diminished significantly. And then heart rates of 175, et cetera, you know, that's, that's where the term lose your shit came from. And quite literally, you know, people can lose bowel and bladder function, and it doesn't look good in the resuscitation room when that happens. So that's environment external, environment internal. The other part of the context environment is the learning environment. It's a little bit of a pet peeve. Yes, anybody can intubate. This is a video of my son, who is then eight years old, intubating a mannequin in our living room on a device that we had developed that I lost a lot of money on. Now, he was grounded after this because he was a bit rough with uh, the removal of the device after, but he intubated this mannequin in under 30 seconds. So yes, anybody can do it, but this is what we call classroom bias. We learn to manage on mannequins, manage airways on, on mannequins, and practice and plastic makes perfect, right? But uh, we've all probably learned on what? A Lairdell, maybe a Medi, or a TrueCore type of mannequin, right? 
three, four types of mannequins over time. There are over seven billion people in this world. There are over seven billion variations of airway anatomy that are out there. And I find it fascinating and incredibly frustrating that there is currently no one mannequin out there that reproduces and reinforces all of the core things that make a difference. You know, jaw thrust, you know, during bag mass ventilation. You're not going to be rewarded with that by doing a mannequin, whereas in real life, it is a life, you know, a, a life-saving kind of uh, intervention. Um, a lot of them don't, uh, the, the mannequins don't have appropriate, you know, chest rise when you ventilate them. You know, they don't respond to external laryngeal manipulation. They don't respond to uh, bougie as they would uh, in, in, a real, uh, in a real patient. They don't accommodate various superglottic airways, and they don't have realistic surgical airways. So we've got all this technology out there, and yet we don't have one mannequin that reinforces all these core airway skills that we all learn airway management on. Okay, so that's context. Let's move on to, to confidence. Um, this is a famous philosopher, and, and uh, this philosopher uh, said uh, a, a very profound uh, uh, quote um, that's out there that I love. This is the screensaver. We've all got uh, plans until we got punched in the mouth. And we've all been punched in the mouth. I mean, there's giggles around here, and there's giggles saying, I know what you mean. You know? Um, I, I, I understand that. This is a, a fascinating study that never was ultimately published, but they were, they were looking at, at teaching medics how to, how to intubate and how many tubes is required. You know, so one group, did, one group did five, one group did 10, and one group did 20. They never figured out what was the right number, but interestingly, when you ask them who was most confident, it was the group that did five, right? Why? Because they had five easy airways. And they judged the rest of the world based on those five easy airways. We, we realized that with, with age and time, we could become more conservative. And wh why we become more conservative is because we've, we've seen shit happen. And we get humbled by those experiences. So this is the other piece. If anybody, I don't know if you've heard of Dunning and Kruger. If you haven't, you've got to look them up. And this is a graphic representation of what they found, is that soon after we, we get out in the real world, we're, we're most confident, right? And, and Dunning and Kruger would say, this is the, the peak of Mount Stupid, right? <laughs> um, and, and then what happens as we get out there is we realize that you know, shit happens, and this is the valley of despair, right? And many of us know people that have left this field because of you know, some bad things that have happened. They've been humbled, and, and bad things have happened and said, I, I can't do this anymore. But we need to survive that. And ultimately, over time, we gain experience and expertise and hopefully reach a, a level of expert or guru status. But it doesn't look like this. It doesn't look like a straight line. It's, a, it's, it's, it's up and down over time, and we will continuously be humbled over time um, in our careers. It's in another way, Mark Twain, the man of many quotes, Good judgment is the result of experience, and experience the result of bad judgment. And this is one of my other, my other favorites, is success. Success doesn't look like this, you know, on the, on the, what is it, the left, right? Success is what's going on the right. If I had two people that I was going to hire, right, the person who was, you know, got the blue ribbons, they were at the top of their class, you know, they just, you know, they, they, you know, climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and they, you know, worked with Mother Teresa and all of this sort of stuff. That's all great, right? But I want some people that are going to have some life experience that have fallen um, over time because they're going to bring that experience to the table and that's going to benefit their, their patients ultimately. So competence, uh, context, confidence, and the last one is the most important, the toughest one, which is conscientiousness. And conscientiousness is two things. It's, it's working ethically, and then it's having an appropriate work ethic. And what do I mean by working ethically? We have to remember that it's not about you, right? It's not about you getting the tube, and therefore you've been successful, right? You need to get the tube, but not at all costs. You need to make sure that you've done it um, and, and maintain the, the, the rule of 90s um, as best you can. And you also have to appreciate that it might not always be you, right? A call for help should never be considered a, a sign of weakness, 
right? It's recognizing that there are limitations that you might bring to the table, and if you have the opportunity, then seek help, whether it's asking a question or getting extra hands in the, uh, in the room. This is my favorite quote, and I can't find out who, who wrote it. I did try, and this is about work ethic. Don't be upset by the results you didn't get with the work that you didn't do. And this is the challenge that we all face here. It really is up to us to not be, you know, be successful because we're lucky, because we, n these cases didn't present to us. We need to be able to seek out the skill to be able to manage the range of patients that are going to face us. And we need to off that means we often have to do things that are uncomfortable for us. And that's what stress inoculation is about or anti-fragile uh, simulation. And I'm going to use the example of the surgical airway because there's no, there's no such thing as being experienced in the surgical airway, right? You know, one, you know, you're, you know it's, it's, uh, it's unfortunate. If you've done more than one, you better look at your skill set. Um, it's, it's unlikely that you're going to have a lot of exposure to a surgical airway over, over time. So how do we train for these high acuity, low opportunity scenarios? And you can say that intubation is a high acuity, low opportunity scenario. One of the ways, again, is by doing what's called system one training. What system one training is, this, these are called uh, martial art kata. I, I don't do martial arts, but you know, the, 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 all of these choreographed movements that are done are a series of, of you know, 20 or 30 specific steps that they learn and then put them together. And that's what we really need to do for these uncommon experiences. We need to learn as many, but execute as one. So when you look at the simplest way to do a surgical airway, it's a bougie-assisted surgical airway. It still involves about 11 steps, right? And how are you going to engage those 11 steps when that person is in a situation where they're dying if you don't do this in 90 seconds correctly, right? The only way to do this is do system one training. And system one training doesn't have to be something that you're, you've got to go somewhere to do. You can do psychomotor rehearsal yourself where you go through the maneuvers as if you have the equipment in your hand. And you do that on a regular basis. And then on top of that, you go and you take those same steps and you do them on a mannequin on a regular basis to say, OK, every month I'm going to do this. You know, so that then you can escalate it again and then do it in a situation that we all have a potential opportunity to access, which is the uses of what we're seeing here is clinical cadavers, where we can get the tissue experience of doing that procedure um, that, again, we're going to uncommonly um, be required to, uh, to perform. So system one training. And the reason why we have to do this is we know from the literature, if you don't, what we tend to do when we're faced with something that scares you, you just do the same thing over and over again. Just give me a little bit, just give me another try, give me another try. And that's what Einstein apparently called uh, insanity. You know, doing the same thing repeatedly, expecting some sort of different outcome. It's fixation bias and we need to avoid it. System one training is the way you do it. I'm gonna close with this, is that, uh, you know, this is lessons from combat and chemistry. Are there ways that we can manage our stress physiology to improve performance in patient care? And, and uh, I don't have a magic bullet, but I'll tell you something that I do. And, and uh, uh, you know, if I've got time, and we often have time, that there's a case that's coming in, I often go to the bathroom for various reasons. One is I'm, you know, in my mid-50s, and I just have to go to the bathroom <laughs> a lot more often. But when I'm there, I look in the mirror and I say, you know what? I got this. You know, um, I, I've been trained to do this. I've got my mentors there, right? I've got Rich Levitin in the room. I've got a couple of my anesthesia colleagues. I'm going to do what I've been taught to do, and things are going to be okay. And that's been shown to have that sort of you know positive um, outlook. Actually, that it it decreases. The, the hormones that cause you know, bad kind of stress and increases the hormones that let you perform better. It's been shown physiologically to do that. And the other thing you can do is breathe, and all you need is a couple minutes you know, while you're you know, having your leak in the bathroom or looking in the mirror, and you, and you do this, this breathing. Who's got an Apple Watch now? It's built into your Apple Watch, and you hit the button, and it says, okay, you know, three to four second breath in, three to four second hold, three to four second breath out. And, and then repeat that cycle. And again, that's been shown to, again, alter your hormonal stress physiology in a more favorable way. 
and things that you can do perhaps in a minute or two before you go in and face the, uh, um, the uh, reality of what's, uh, what's before you. I'm going to close with this. This is a book um, that I, I, uh, I read a couple summers ago by Gonzales called Deep Survival. It has nothing to do with airway management, but I think some great messages here. Um, fear and anxiety um, are normal. It's, it, it's how you deal with it that makes a, makes a difference. Having a plan is necessary, but really survival is about how you adapt when your plan fails. And you have to keep in mind this last point is the environment won't adapt to your skill level. So make sure you bring the skills necessary to take care of your patients. Thank you very much.